Welcome, welcome, welcome. Let's take a moment to welcome all of our guests that are tuning in by Facebook Live, our Transformation Church Live broadcast from all around the world and the country. Thank you for tuning in. Want to give it up for the five correctional facility partnerships, mighty men and beautiful women. We love y'all. We believe in you. And to our guests here at Transformation Church 521, thank you so much for being here. Uh, we are applauding, uh, not for me, not for our musicians, as awesome as they are. We are applauding what Jesus is going to do through the music and through the message beforehand. So we thank him in advance. It's a, it's a posture of faith, believing. So we're going to conclude our series, um, The Breath of God. I hope it's uh, encouraged you as much as it has encouraged me. Uh, how many of you like gifts? How many, how many of you love gifts? All right, all right, listen, fellas, all right? And for those of you that are married, those of you that one day want to be married, or you just want to do nice things for some, someone, get people gifts on days you're not supposed to. Like, you can get flowers on other days besides the day you're supposed to. All right, that served me well. By the way, Vicky and I just celebrated our 27th wedding anniversary. We grown, y'all. We grown. Uh, so we're about to be empty nesters. And uh, I had a, a, a pastor's wife, and they've been married like 40 something years. And she said, Don't even worry about it. Being an empty nester is like being a newlywed, except you got experience. I was like, I like that. Praise the Lord, pastor's wife. <laughs> but we love gifts, though. Gifts, gifts are good things. Well, God the Father has given humanity. God the Father has given you and I the greatest gift of all gifts. His son. His son is glorious, and his son is a king. Don't get it twisted, Jesus is a king. As a matter of fact, Pontius Pilate didn't even know what he was doing, but on the cross, he wrote above Jesus' cross in three different languages, behold, the king of the Jews. Jesus is a king, but he doesn't stay dead. He rises again to inaugurate his kingdom. And he is summoning you and I into his kingdom by grace. So what I'm saying is this, is Jesus is offering you more than a personal relationship. Uh, I understand the sentiment of it, but it's so below a covenant with a king. He is summoning us into his kingdom. But before the king does that, before he fashions us after him, because you do know God's goal, you, you ready? By the way, uh, just going to switch gears here real quick. Last week, a clip from my message where I said the Holy Spirit's highest priority is to form Christ in you, it went viral. Amen. Like, people were like, wow! And I was like, guys, this is basic Christianity. <laughs> like, what's happened? Okay, okay, so, so, so hear my heart. Like, like, for some reason, God has allowed me to mentor other pastors and, and our church as a model and all those things. But what has happened to us that something so basic that God the Holy Spirit's goal is to make you like Jesus and not make your dreams come true because our dreams are so much below God's kingdom that when we tap into his heart for what he wants for us, we look at our dreams. I look at my dreams and go, wow, that is so, so beneath what God actually wants to do. So we unashamedly preach the gospel here. We preach the Bible here. We are a people of the sacred text. God, God wants to shape us. He wants the world. His purpose is to fill the world with Jesus Christ lookalikes. That's what heaven on earth looks like. So God wants to shape us into those people. But Jesus was disfigured and shaped by a Roman cross that was shaped by your hands and my hands. But when he rises again, he, he, he gives us a new life. His shed blood frees us from sin and death and evil. Understand this, I'm thankful for God's forgiveness. I'm thankful that God makes us righteous, but I'm also thankful that I am and you are free from the things that made us ask for forgiveness in the first place. You are no longer a prisoner. The cell doors have been flung open. The dungeon is no longer your house. 
So God pays our debt, a debt he didn't owe, but a debt we couldn't pay. Not because he owed us love, but because he is love. So not only do we get the gift of Jesus, the Holy Spirit goes, yo, Jesus, I want to give some gifts too. Did you know that God, the Holy Spirit, if you are a follower of Christ, if you're not yet a follower of Christ, put this in your pocket, but for those of you who are followers of Christ, God has given you through the Holy Spirit's power a spiritual gift and or gifts. I know what you're thinking. You go, but really, seriously? Yeah, seriously. You go, but, 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 but pastor, you don't really know me. Well, I don't know you, but I know God knows you. Well, 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 I'm imperfect. Well, never forget, God uses imperfect people because that's all he's got to work with. And for those of you, like all of us got stuff from our past. We've, we've heard certain things from family. You'll just be like everybody else. Or, or maybe you were that kid who, who, who at school when they were picking teams, the girls got picked before you. And li li listen, all that, throw that away. God, because he is love, because he is sovereign, because he is good, says, I'm going to give you a spiritual gift and or gifts. Why does he do that? God the Holy Spirit gives us, teenagers, God the Holy Spirit gives us spiritual gifts for the common good of the church. So let me, uh, as the young people say, let me finesse this for a moment. So what does Holy Spirit do? He, he gives us spiritual gifts. This means that God gifts us with abilities that we didn't have. In other words, God takes our inabilities and turns them into supernatural abilities. Like, I remember this guy who God called to preach, and this guy goes, not me, Lord, I'm a stutterer, I can't talk. Well, that's me. I knew you knew that. So, so whatever your inability is, if God gives you a supernatural gift, it transcends our inability, and why does he do it? For the common good of the church. What is the church? The church is not the seats we're sitting in. The church is not this pulpit. The church is not this stage. The church is people. Jesus, whose flesh and blood died for flesh and blood. So right now, the church is gathering, and then the church will scatter. You know why I don't like the words, I go to church? Well, first of all, it's unbiblical. And secondly, what are you doing Monday through Saturday? Don't bifurcate your life. Okay, I got my spiritual life Sunday, and then Monday through Saturday, I'm whatever. No, church is like the last name. Some of you who are older, you remember when you went out on your first date, you didn't know what you was doing, you had on so much cologne that it caused climate change. <laughs> and when you left the house, your mom or your dad or your grandparents said, keep my name good, because that's all I got. In other words, your behavior reflects who you're named after. Well, we're named after Jesus and he calls us church. The word church just means called out. Jesus spoke into darkness and death and pulled us into his light and his love. And so God says, I'm gonna give you gifts for the common good of my church. Why is that important? Because the world is looking going, is there a better way? Is there a better way to be human? Think about it. We live in such a culture of outrage, everybody's so mad, everybody's got opinions, everybody's so divided, and sadly, oftentimes the church plays a role in that, and God is going to know, I want you to show the world a better way to be human, and my Holy Spirit is going to gift you to be able to do that. Where do we get this from? I'm glad you asked. We got it from the Bible. Let me give you some background. Paul wrote Corinthians in about A.D. 58. Corinth uh, was a major city. It would be like Las Vegas. What, stay, what, stay, what goes to Vegas stays in Vegas, you know what I'm saying? Like this place was wild. And so Paul planted churches that were multi-ethnic, multi-class. Jews and Gentiles, enemies became family. And they were struggling with their spiritual gifts. You know why? Because like most immature Christians, they use their spiritual gifts as a way to build themselves up. I have to confess, 
as a panther, I'd been saved about a year, and I was leading away arguing about spiritual gifts. I was so annoying. God gave me a gift to teach and to understand the scripture, but my character was not where my knowledge was. One of the things we say here at Transformation Church is this. You always want your gifts chasing your character, not your character chasing your gifts. So I would perpetuate these arguments and so forth. And so Paul is helping these young Christians understand why God has gifted them. So he says this. Now, there are different gifts, but the same spirit. So not all of us are gonna have the same gifts. We're gonna have different gifts, just like on a basketball team. Or better yet, since I'm now getting into soccer, my son got me into soccer. Yes, I am team Ronaldo, and I am not ashamed of it. <laughs> you gotta have different players for different purposes. There are different ministries. The word ministry just means to serve. Now, I want you to understand this. All of us, if you're a follower of Christ, you are in full-time ministry. It's just the Bank of America pays you to do it. Wait, y'all don't know if y'all caught, caught, caught that. You are in full-time ministry, it's just that Bank of America pays you to do it. Some of you are going, I wanna be in ministry, and God is going, look around your office, dude. All these crazy lost people. You're right where you're supposed to be. I wanna be where the action is. You guys at work have more contact with unbelievers than I do throughout the week. I have to go set myself up to do it. I have to go to Starbucks to do it. You got built-in lost people all around you. And you're like, I need ministry. What do missionaries do in other co countries? This is, this is deep, y'all. You ready? They get jobs. And then they start talking to other human beings. And they love them, and they serve them, and they work with excellence. And people get curious and go, why are you this way? And then they talk to them about Jesus. I wonder if we did that in America, what would happen? So that's like the impetus for y'all to go, oh, Okay, all right, we good, we there. <laughs> Verse six, and there are different activities, but the same God. Okay, let me pause here. I'm a theology dude. I want you to be a theology dude or theology dude at. Watch this, Holy Spirit, the Lord Jesus, God the Father. There's the Trinity right there. Father, Son, Spirit. That's not just dry dead theology. We wouldn't have spiritual gifts without Father, Son, and Spirit. Now watch this. And there are different activities, but the same God produces each gift in each person. You hear that? It's God, the Holy Spirit, who does it. You don't have to work for it. You don't, you, you don't have to try for it. The moment you say yes to Jesus, not only are you born again, but you have a supernatural gift that it is God's responsibility to put in you. He does it. He doesn't, it, you don't have to produce it. And by the way, now for some of us, this is gonna be a little cold water in our face, and for some of us, we need some humility. If you always have to tell someone you got a spiritual gift, <laughs> if you always gotta walk into a room and I can do this, and so let me take you back to my old job. I knew dudes could not play football by how much they talked about how they could play. You ain't gotta tell me nothing. When we put on pads, when we line up, your pads will do the talking. You ain't gotta tweet about it, you ain't gotta Instagram about it, by the sound of the clack clack, we'll know. <laughs> Skirt like, you know what I'm talking about, the clack clack? So like if, well, you know, when I come to your church, Derwin, I can do, hey, 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 just do it. In the words of Nike, just do it. And then when you do it, people go, oh, I see it. And, and, and then for those of us going, what's my spiritual gift? Guess how you discover it? By serving. Not in your perfect spot, but in any spot. So at Forest Hill Church, had no idea I wanted to be a pastor, David Chadwick, a mentor and a friend. Love that man, support that man, 100%. Uh, I'm, I'm so as a mentor and a friend, I was like, what should I do? He, he goes, just serve. So you know what I did? 
One week I'd be preaching on the stage, and next week Vicky and I would be in childcare holding babies. And then since I didn't have a job because I didn't know what I needed to do for a job, I said, "What else can I do?" They said, "We have this really exciting ministry. You go over to this house over there. There's a little basement about 200 square feet, and it's really dark. And there's a bunch of prayer requests in it. So you read over the prayer requests and write people notes that they've been prayed for." That's what I did. So for some of you talking about. Yeah, when am I going to get to preach? When are you going to be okay being in a basement with no one seeing you or noticing you? Because if you ain't ready for that, you ain't ready for this. As a matter of fact, that's what hurts a lot of young people is they're incredibly gifted and they get exalted too fast and they become tyrants. Woo-wee, okay. This is fun. Verse 7, a manifestation of the Spirit is given to each person for the common good. So let me tell you, if you consider Transformation Church your home, we need you. You are essential. You are important. A friend of mine that coaches ball was telling me that uh, his team was playing this, this one school, and the school was just crushing them. They had some big players. And this one kid who wanted to play finally had his chance, and a coach looks back at him and said, okay, son, get in. And he goes, coach, I'm not your guy. We never say that. It's time for you to get in. I know you're afraid, but God got you. I know you don't think you can do it, and you're right, but God can do it. And you learn as you go, and you grow as you go. To one is given a message of wisdom. This is the Greek word Sophia. Wisdom is the skill to live life. So there's people that are gifted through walking with the Lord that they have a skill to live life, which is a life of love. By the way, you want to surround yourself with wise people. If you want to know where you're going in life, look at your five closest friends. Birds of a feather? Wow. (laughs) Of wisdom through the Spirit. To another, a message of knowledge. Knowledge means you are able to take complex theological doctrines and make them easy for people to understand. I remember I was a brand new Christian. My mentor, Alan Bacon, asked me a question about something. I was able to synthesize it and break it down. He's like, you have the gift of knowledge. I was like, not what? He goes, don't worry about it. You'll see by the same spirit, and to another, faith by the same spirit. So all of us exercise faith, but this kind of faith is like a supernatural gift of faith. And not just that God's going to do something for me, but that God's going to do something for his glory. My wife has this spiritual gift. I remember early on going, okay, this multi-ethnic church thing is not going to work because if it was going to work, there would be more churches that are doing it, we've got nowhere to go, it's not gonna happen, she's like, God got it. And then we get into a warehouse about a mile down the road, and before we could start the church, our, what was gonna be our parking lot was just this grassy swamp. We brought a company in, it cost 35,000, the church didn't have it, I'm like, oh, we can't do it, oh, I'm crying, no, we ain't gonna do it. She's like, no, God got this. She had a dream, the owner of the company, and the dream told her, we're gonna pay for the parking lot. She didn't tell me about it. Two weeks go by, she sees the owner of the company and the company says, y'all still gonna do that church? She says, we're not sure. He goes, well, if you are, God told us to do the parking lot for free. And you know what I was doing? It ain't gonna happen, it's not gonna happen. (laughs) And to another, gifts of healing by one spirit. There are people who have the capacity to heal, and I'm going to talk more about that. To another, the performing of miracles. Just because you haven't seen a miracle doesn't mean a miracle can't happen. To another, prophecy. I'm going to explain that. To another, distinguishing between spirits. This is the ability to know if a message is from God or not. Please listen. If you hear a message... And the victory of Jesus over sin, death, and evil is not mentioned. That's not New Testament preaching. Nowhere in the New Testament or Old Testament can you read 
or hear a message from any of the apostles that do not deal with those three great enemies. If you're not hearing that, you're not hearing a Christian message. You're hearing a motivational speech that you can get anywhere. To another, different kinds of tongues. We're going to talk about that. To another, interpretation of tongues. And one in the same spirit is active in all these, distributing to each person as he wills. So when we say teamwork makes the dream work, that is really, really true, that all of us are needed. So let's look at three of what I call the most controversial gifts that have divided the Christian church that cause a lot of problems. And what's ironic is the Holy Spirit's role is to bring unity between us. So if you're not yet a Christian, it's important to understand this because God may give you one of these gifts. So, so let's talk about tongues. And the first expression of tongues in the Bible is what I call missional tongues or missionary tongues. Okay? Missional tongues or missionary tongues. Where do we get this from? Glad you asked. Let's look at Genesis. In the beginning, when God created Adam and Eve, he wanted a family. Adam and Eve chose to bring sin and rebellion into the world. What does God do? He raises up Noah, and after Noah, we've got some people, and they're building a city. The problem is not that they're building a city. The problem is they're not doing what God asked them to do. What did God tell Adam and Eve? I want you to scatter throughout the earth. Here's why. As human beings, we are image bearers of God, and as we scatter throughout the earth, when, when we trust him, his glory and his image fills the earth. But these people were like, nope, we're going to stay right here, right where we are. So look what God does. Come, let us go down there and confuse their language so that they will not understand one another's speech. So from there, the Lord scattered them. Remember, be fruitful and multiply. By the way, if you want to stay and God's telling you to go, you're going to go. I'll never be a pastor. <laughs> How many of y'all remember me saying that from the old days? Any of y'all remember, remember that? From there, the Lord scattered them throughout the earth. That's what he always wanted. And they stopped building the city. So God's family is scattered, but like any loving father, he's like, but I'm getting my babies back. Watch this. Genesis 12 in a moment. Therefore, it is also called Babylon, for there the Lord confused the language of the whole earth, and from there the Lord scattered them throughout the earth. So let's look at Genesis 12 now. God is in conversation with a man named Abram, and he changes his name to Abraham in Genesis 15, which means father of many. So look what he says. Go out from your land. There's this missional. Go. Your relatives and your father's house to the land I will show you. Some of you high schoolers getting ready to graduate. And go to the land and he'll show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse anyone that treats you with contempt. And listen to the words. And all the peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. So ultimately... Abraham becomes the father of the nation of Israel, and Jesus Christ comes and he completes the story of Israel. Everything that Israel was to do, Jesus did perfectly, and watch what happens in Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost had arrived, let's pause here. Pentecost means 50. So 50 days after the Jewish festival called Passover. What happened during Passover? The Jewish people were slaves in Egypt. God said, sacrifice a lamb, put the blood over your door, the angel of death will pass by, and you will be set free. Jesus is called what? The Lamb of God. And so through his blood, we are set free to go to the new heavens and the new earth in a new exodus, except for now, God's people is not just one ethnic group. It's now all the world. Watch this. When the day of Pentecost had arrived, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like that of a violent rushing wind came from heaven, and it filled the whole house where they were staying. They saw tongues like flames of fire that separated and rested on each one of them. Then they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak different tongues. This word glossolalia means languages. As the Spirit enabled them. 
Now there were Jews staying in Jerusalem. Why? Because they were all there from Passover. Now watch this. Devout people from every nation under heaven. Question. If I was speaking Swahili about how great God is, could you understand that? So how can you go back to your place if you don't know what the message is? When the sound occurred, a crowd came together and was confused because each one heard them speaking in his own language. They were astounded and amazed, saying, look, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? The Galilean Jewish people had a, um, let me give you an example. If you meet somebody from Boston, you know they're from Boston, Pak de Kah. Okay, yeah, you, you get it, right. So they're like, how are these Galileans speaking our language? How is it that each of us can hear them in our own native tongue? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, those who live in Mesopotamia, in Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts, Christians and Arabs, were hearing them declaring the magnificent acts of God in their own tongues. Acts chapter two is the reversal of Genesis 11 and the fulfillment of Genesis 12. Missional tongues is so the message of God can go forth, not to show how spiritual we are. When I went to India, I said, Lord, I was preaching in what's called the Kalpar slums. The people in India in the Kalpar slums are part of the untouchable class. It's literally a garbage dump. So please, hear my heart, don't complain, it's hot. We were in 104 degree weather in a garbage dump with no wind, and these people were happy and praising. I didn't get the gift of tongues, I had an interpreter, but I prayed for it. They were all astounded and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But some sneered and said, they're drunk on new wine. So Acts chapter two fulfills what God said. So they heard the message and they took the message throughout the world. So that, that's missional tongues. Another aspect of tongues is what some would call private prayer tongues, okay? Where do we get this from? 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses one through four. Pursue love. Let's pause there. Pursue love. Pursue love. Pursue love. Why do I keep saying that? Because Jesus said, you will know my disciples because they... Tongues can be faked. Prophecy can be faked. Healings can be faked. But you can't fake love. Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, and especially that you may prophesy. I'm gonna explain that in a moment. For the person who speaks in another tongue is not speaking to people, but to God. Since no one understands him, he speaks mysteries in the spirit. On the other hand, the person who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening, encouragement, and consolation. The person who speaks in another tongue builds himself up, but the person who but the one who prophesies builds up the church. So in Corinth, there was this ecstatic utterance or prayer that people did in private that they brought out in public. So here's my, my thing. If you have a private prayer language, that's great. That's awesome. But are you more loving after you do, do it? Are you more humble after you do, do, do it? It's all about love and Humility. Also, 1 Corinthians 12, 29, or maybe 14, 29, I think it's 1 Corinthians 12, 29, says that not all speak in tongues. First year of seminary, I was sitting next to a Russian Pentecostal, and we we're talking about tongues. And I said, well, I've never spoken in tongues as you describe. He goes, well, I'm not saying you're not saved. You just don't have power. And in my mind, I'm like, the very fact that I just didn't choke you shows I have power because <laughs> I have the power to control myself. I didn't say it, I wanted to. So if you have a private prayer language, that's great. 
That's awesome, but not everybody has that gift, just like you may not have somebody else's gift, but the litmus test is how humble and how loving are we. What is prophecy? Prophecy is primarily communicating the gospel. When we prophesy, it says strengthening, encouragement, and consolation. There is no greater news to strengthen or encourage than the work of Jesus. And so prophecy is being able to communicate. In a way, that's what I'm doing now. I am communicating the gospel when you encourage someone with what Christ has done, okay? Now, are there times that people can have insight into what may take place in your life? Yes. Early on in my faith, I was at a Bible study. It was kind of weird. I was uncomfortable. And all of a sudden, the guy who was leading it stopped blowing a trumpet and looked at me, ran towards me, fell at my feet, and said, God is gonna use you to preach the gospel. You're gonna be in auditoriums. You're gonna be in stadiums. I was like, okay. (laughs) So, So here's my point. Can God do that? Yes, but live your life not by what someone says, but by what the word of God says. If someone encourages that, that's awesome. Um, I had a friend of mine who was speaking at a church. He's a handsome guy. And a lady at that church was like, the Lord just gave me a prophecy about you. You're going to be my husband. (laughs) And he was like, well, I don't think my wife's going to agree with that. (laughs) So what I'm saying is, live more by the word of God. Okay? <laughs> Be like, nah, Vicky ain't going for that. Get an ice pick in your neck. <laughs> healing, let's talk about healing. Healing. I can say this with incredible confidence. Your healing, if you're a follower of Christ, is guaranteed in the resurrection. Our he- by his stripes, We are healed. What happened to Jesus will happen to all of us. Sickness and death have been defeated by the resurrection of Jesus. I think all of us would agree with that, but that's where our ultimate hope is, okay? Let me mess you up here for a minute in a good way. When Jesus healed someone, how long did it last? Because they still died. I mean, was it like one week? The scripture doesn't say. And I think that's important for us. I don't know about you. I don't like being sick. I don't like people I love being sick. Man, I have prayed for folks. You have prayed for folks. Some of them miraculously healed. Praise God. But eventually, we all go to the grave. But eventually, the one who conquered the grave calls us out. So when someone's sick, do we pray? Yes, we do. Do we anoint with oil? Yes, we do. But if God in his sovereignty says, it's time for you to graduate and come home, that doesn't mean he is not healed. That doesn't mean, mean, mean that. Yeah. Yeah, you, and, 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 and y'all, this is like, like I'm at the age now where this isn't like theory. Uh, you, you, you guys were there when Vicky was in the hospital. She had uh, cancer of the thyroid, and you guys were at the hospital the whole day. Man, was I praying that God would heal her and that would never come back? Yeah. And people always cheer like, yeah, God did it. But for some of us, God didn't do it in that way. But we still cheer because our final hope is in the resurrection. So we pray, we anoint with oil, we ask him, but it doesn't mean you don't have enough faith. And also, if somebody on TV tell you, send in $29.95, I'll send you a handkerchief, you'll be healed, don't do it. That's superstition. Don't do it. I have a lot of patience for a lot of stuff, but not for pimping and prostituting Jesus and hurting people that are already poor. (laughs) Do we believe that God is a healer? Yes. But never forget, though, that the healing is not always physical. It's emotional. All right. Pause, 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 pause. I forgot. I forgot. Pause, pause. Pause, pause. Good job. My bad. My bad. I messed y'all up. Okay, so uh, the gentleman you just seen, his name is Robert F. Smith, 
Uh, he's a tech investor billionaire. So he got some ducats. He got some loot. And he was at Morehouse College, and um, he decided for 400 graduates of this year's class to pay off all of their debt. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I'm just saying, imagine if the 20th, 20 richest billionaires in America did that. I mean, when you're worth 10 billion, 40 billion is like 50 bucks to us. Imagine the lives that are changed. So when he announces this, watch their reaction. Check this out. Men of Morehouse, you are surrounded by a community of people who have helped you arrive at this sacred place and on this sacred day. On behalf of the eight generations of my family who have been in this country, we're going to put a little fuel in your bus. Now, I've got the alumni over there, and this is a challenge to you, alumni. This is my class, 2019. And my family is making a grant to eliminate their student loans. So, did you see that one kid's face? <laughs> did you see the unbelievable moment? I mean, think about it. To have your student debt, you know, if you want to raise your hands, you can. If you don't want to, you don't have to. How many of y'all are still paying off student debt? Raise your hands. Can you imagine if that was just wiped away, the freedom? Can, can you imagine that? The freedom that you would have? Moms and dads, college is expensive, right? Imagine that. Well, I got some really good news for you to wrap this up. Colossians 2.14 says this. He, speaking of Jesus, erased the certificate of debt. What was our debt? It was an insurmountable amount. Bitcoin couldn't pay for it. Gold bullion couldn't pay for it. Platinum Bill Gates bank account couldn't pay for it. With its obligations that was against us and opposed to us, and has been taking it away by nailing it to the cross. This is why we preach the cross. Our debt has been paid. You are liberated. You are set free. And what do we do? We praise him for it. We thank him for it. <laughs> but but God goes, but I ain't even done yet. Not only is your debt paid, but I've deposited a gift in you. Our worship team is gonna sing and then I'm gonna come back out and lead us in prayer. God has delivered us. He's redeemed us, he's adopted us, and he's made us into a new family. So with one voice, we'll praise the God of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's sing it. By the fall, we were divided, but by your cross, we've been united. Once we were far, now we're adopted. As your own oh, From the grave Called into freedom From our shame Into your kingdom To proclaim Highest of praises At your throne So with one voice, let's sing it out, y'all.
in its purpose every life offered in worship to your will this lord your deserving Spirit, we thank you that you unify us as brothers and sisters in the family of God the Father because Jesus, through his blood, canceled our debt by nailing it to the cross. As a result of this debt being canceled, you, Holy Spirit, have not only given us the very presence of God, but you've given us the very power of God through the spiritual gifts which are for the common good. I pray that we would be eager to discover what our gifts are so that we can love more effectively. That we would serve not because we have to but because we get to and that we want to. That we would be a gifted, love-filled, spirit-filled church. That the world would, would look that those who are orphans would find a good, good father, that those who are broken would find wholeness and healing because of the Lord Jesus. And those who are helpless and powerless would find help and power because of you, God the Holy Spirit. We love you, Lord. I believe that there are some here that needs their debt paid that need their sin debt paid. You you know who you are. You know what's happening inside of you. Well, I've got good news. Jesus is ready to nail it to the cross if you're ready to give it to him. If you're ready to give him your life, he's ready to nail your debt to the cross, and he's ready to nail his grace to you. He's ready to give you a new life and a new hope and a new power. 
If that's you in the silence of your heart, would you say this to him? Today, Lord Jesus, I choose to have my sin debt canceled and nailed to the cross. With my heart, I believe, and with my mouth, I confess that you are Lord and that you died for me and you rose again to place me in your family. Fill me with your spirit. Seal me with your spirit. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. Can we give God a round of applause?